In this lecture, we'll be discussing antenna types. This is the outline of the lecture. First, we'll take a look at basic antennas, under which we'll be discussing elementary doublet, half-wave dipole, monopole, and rhombic antenna. Next, we'll take a look at antenna accessories, which will be relevant in the next topic, special purpose antennas, in which we'll take a look at Yagi Uda antenna, log periodic antenna, and helical antenna. Lastly, we'll be discussing UHF and microwave antennas. Of course, the most famous is the parabolic antenna. Elementary doublet. Elementary doublet is a theoretical antenna shorter than a wavelength used as a standard to which all other antenna characteristics can be compared to. This is often referred to simply as short dipole, elementary dipole, or Hertzian dipole. The formula for the electric field for elementary double antenna is given in this equation E is equal to 60 pi times the current I times the length L sine theta in which theta is given in the image on the left divided by lambda this is the wavelength of the electromagnetic wave being transmitted times R. R is the distance from the antenna. And power is given by this equation. P is equal to 30 pi I squared L squared sine squared theta divided by pi squared I squared. Next, let's take a look at the half wave dipole antenna. This is one of the most widely used antennas at frequencies above 2 MHz. This is referred to as a Hertz antenna after Heinrich Hertz, who was the first to demonstrate the existence of electromagnetic waves. A Hertz antenna is a resonant antenna. It is a multiple of quarter wavelengths long and open circuited at the far end, which will of course radiate electromagnetic waves. The impedance of a half-wave dipole varies from a maximum value at the end points of approximately 2,500 ohms to a minimum value at the feed point of approximately 73 ohms. Feed point is the point at which the antenna is connected to the transmission line. Maximum radiation of a half-wave dipole is in a parallel plane to the Earth's surface, and for 90 degrees, there is no radiation present. If the dipole is not driven at the center, then the feed point resistance will be higher. If the feed point is x distance from one end of a half wave dipole, the resistance will be described by the following equation. R sub x, this is the resistance, is equal to 75 over sine squared pi x over lambda. Next, we have the monopole. A monopole is one quarter wavelength long mounted vertically with the lower end connected directly to ground or grounded through an antenna coupling network. This is also called a Marconi antenna. The characteristics of a Marconi antenna are similar to those of the Hertz antenna because of the ground reflected waves. This has the disadvantage of being located close to the ground. Next we have the rhombic antenna. The rhombic antenna is a non-resonant antenna that is capable of operating satisfactorily over a relatively wide bandwidth, making it ideally suited for high frequency transmission. It is made up of four non-resonant elements each several wavelengths long, the entire array is terminated in a resistor if unidirectional operation is desired. The terminating resistor absorbs approximately one-third of the total antenna input power. Therefore, the rhombic antenna has a maximum efficiency of only 67% and gains over 16 decibels can be achieved. 
Now we'll be looking at antenna accessories. First, let's take a look at the antenna grounding system. Antenna grounding is used to reduce losses caused by the ground in the immediate vicinity of the antenna. As you can see in the image, there is a counterpoise. The counterpoise consists of a structure made from wires erected at a short distance above the ground and insulated from the ground. Next, we have an earth mat or ground screen. It is a network of up to 120 buried wires 15 to 30 centimeters below the ground under the antenna and arranged in a radial pattern. Such a radial system of conductors is usually one half wavelength in diameter. Antenna loading. It is possible to increase the electrical length of an antenna by a technique called loading. When an antenna is loaded, its physical length remains unchanged, although its effective electrical length is increased. A loading coil is a coil added in series with a dipole antenna, effectively increasing the antenna electrical length. A loading coil effectively increases the radiation resistance of the antenna by approximately 5 ohms. So as you can see in the image, the loading coil is connected in series with the antenna and although this has a minimum, minimal effect on the physical length, the electrical length of the antenna is increased. With top loading, a metallic array that resembles a spoked wheel is placed on top of the antenna. The wheel increases the shunt capacitance to ground reducing the overall antenna capacitance. This also has the same effect as with the coil with the loading coil previously mentioned. Antenna arrays. Antenna arrays are formed when two or more antenna elements are combined to form a single antenna. The purpose of an array is to increase the directivity of an antenna system. There are two types of antenna elements. First is the driven, second is the parasitic. The parasitic elements are also called non-driven elements. The driven elements are directly connected to the transmission line and receives power from the source. Parasitic elements are not connected to the transmission line. They receive energy only through mutual induction with a driven element or other parasitic element. Next, let's take a look at antenna arrays. A parasitic element that is longer than the driven element is called a reflector. And the one that is shorter than the driven element is called a director. A reflector effectively reduces the signal strength in its direction and increases it in the opposite direction, acting like a concave mirror for light. A director increases the field strength in its direction and reduces it in the opposite direction, acting as if it were a convex lens for light. The end fire array is essentially the same configuration as the roadside array, except that the transmission line is not crisscrossed between elements. A roadside array is made by simply placing several resonant dipoles of equal size in parallel with each other and in a straight line. Now here's a table showing the effects on the antenna parameters by adding directors and reflectors. The first type, this isotropic radiator or isotropic antenna. It is the antenna which is used as a reference antenna for other kinds of antennas. As you can see, it has a power gain of 0 and a beam width of 360 degrees. 
which means that it radiates in all directions equally. Front to back ratio is also zero decibels because the front and its back radiation is just equivalent to each other. Next, we have a half wave dipole, one element. This has no parasitic elements. So the power gain is increased to 2.16 decibels. The beam width is narrower. It's only at 80 degrees. The front to back ratio is zero because the, the radiation of a half wave dipole looks like a symbol eight from above. So the radiation in the front is also equal to the radiation in the back. Next. Next, let's take a look at an antenna in which we have added one more element. The added element can either be a director or reflector. So in the table, the power gain is increased to 7.16 decibels. Beam width became narrower at 52 degrees. And the front to back ratio is increased to 15 or 20 decibels. So what happened here is the parasitic element or the non-driven element increased the power gain of the antenna by simply focusing the power on one side. So the front power is greater than the power at the back. And as you can see, the more elements we add to the antenna, the greater the power gain will be. The narrower the, band, the beam width and the front to back ratio is also increased. We'll take a look at an example of this antenna in the later discussions. Special purpose antennas. Okay, here we have the Yagi Uda antenna. Yagi Uda antenna is a wildly used antenna that commonly uses a folded dipole as a driven element. Yagi antennas consist of an array of independent antenna elements. This is not as directional as a parabolic dish antenna, but more directional than dipole antennas. The spacing between elements is generally between 0.1 to 0.2 wavelengths. The typical directivity for a Yagi is between 7 decibels to 9 decibels. This will depend upon the number of parasitic elements added to our antenna. So as you can see in the left side, I'm pretty sure you've seen an actual antenna that looks like this. This is the Yagi Uda antenna. On the right side, we can see the radiation pattern of this antenna. Obviously, the front power is a lot greater than the power of the antenna in its back. These are some of the measurements when constructing a Yagi Uda antenna. Let's start with the driven element, the center element in which the antenna is connected to the transmission line and the feed point is located at the center of the antenna. The length of this driven element is one half of a wavelength. And then the spacing between this element to the reflector or the director is between 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 wavelengths. The director is 0 0.45 wavelength long meaning that it is about 10% shorter than the driven element. And the reflector is at 0 0.55 wavelength, 
which makes it around 10% longer than the driven element. And as you can see, the radiation pattern in image B, most of the radiation or power of the antenna is concentrated in its major lobe, of course, which is where the driven element or the director is pointed to. And the reflector lowers the power in its side. So the back power is significantly lower than the front power. Next, let's take a look at the log periodic antenna. The log periodic antenna derives its name from the fact that the feed point impedance is a periodic function of the operating frequency. Log periodic antennas are directional antennas with relatively constant characteristics over a broad range of frequencies. The gain of this kind of antenna is typically around 8 dBi. DBI is the symbol used when we are comparing the gain of an antenna to an isotropic radiator. Most of the time, it's just the same as dB or decibels. The primary advantage of a log periodic antenna is the, is the impedance of the radiation resistance and radiation pattern to frequency. Log periodic antennas have bandwidth ratio of 10 to 1 or greater. Log periodic antennas, like rhombic antennas, are used mainly for high frequency and very high frequency communications. However, log periodics do not have a terminating resistor and therefore more efficient compared to a rhombic antenna. Now, the design of a log periodic antenna is based on the parameter tau with a value that must be less than 1 and typically between 0 0.7 to 0 0.9. As you can see in the image, the log periodic antenna has the shortest elements near its front and the longest elements at its back. Also, the dimensions of every element and the spacing of each element has a certain ratio. You can look at the ratios of these elements in the formulas to the right. So you can actually compute the length of each element and the spacings between each element by using the formulas. Next, let's take a look at a helical antenna. A helical antenna is a broadband VHF or UHF antenna that is ideally suited for applications for which radiating circular polarized electromagnetic waves are required rather than horizontal or vertically polarized electromagnetic waves. A helical antenna has a minimum of 3 or 4 turns and a maximum of about 20 turns. The more turns it has, the greater its gain. And the power gain ranges between 15 to 20 decibels. These kinds of antennas provide bandwidths anywhere between plus and minus 20% of the center frequency. Let's take a look at the relevant formula for the helical antenna. First, we have the antenna gain. So the antenna gain is equal to 15 times the quantity of pi times d. d is the diameter of one turn. And then divided by lambda, lambda is of course the wavelength equivalent to the speed of light divided by the frequency of the electromagnetic wave being transmitted or received. Now the quantity is squared 
times the quantity of n, n is the number of turns in the helical antenna times s, s is the distance between turns, and then divided by lambda. Now, to solve for the beam width, denoted by theta in here, theta is equal to 52 times the quantity of lambda, of course still the wavelength of the electromagnetic wave, divided by pi times d times the square root of lambda divided by n times s. So the variables in this formula is also the same as the variables in the... Next, we have UHF and microwave antennas. Antennas used for UHF and microwave must be highly directive. Microwave antennas ordinarily have half-power beam widths on the order of 1 degree or less. All the electromagnetic energy emitted by an antenna is not radiated in the main lobe. Some of it is concentrated in the minor lobe and side lobes. And then for this kind of antenna, we have the most popular, the parabolic antennas. Parabolic antennas provide extremely high gain and directivity. A parabolic antenna consists of two main parts. First, the parabolic reflector, and second, the feed mechanism. The efficiency of a parabolic antenna ranges from 55 to 65% with the uniform illumination. So as you can see in the image, so as you can see in the image, the parabola just reflects the electromagnetic waves. And then if it's transmitting, it sends those reflected waves to the atmosphere or towards free space. If the parabolic antenna is receiving, then the reflected waves from the free space or from the atmosphere will be concentrated onto the focus. The focus is where the feed mechanism is connected to. Next, let's take a look at formulas for the parabolic antennas. First, we have the directive gain. The directive gain D is equal to A sub E, which is the effective area, times 4 pi divided by lambda squared. Lambda is the wavelength of the electromagnetic wave being received or transmitted. And then the effective area has this formula. A sub E is equal to pi times D squared divided by 4, in which D is the diameter of the antenna. Lastly, for computing power gain, we have this formula. A sub B, the power gain, is equal to the efficiency times the quantity of pi D divided by lambda quantity squared. And if we want to express this gain in decibels, we have 10 log of the efficiency times pi D over lambda quantity squared. Note that all of the variables is placed inside the logarithm. So parabolic antennas, these are actual pictures of it. A parabolic reflector resembles the shape of a plate or dish. It is not necessary that the dish have a solid metal surface to efficiently reflect or receive the signals. The surface can be a mesh, just like the first picture, provided that the width of the openings is less than 0.1 wavelength. Mesh parabolic antennas rather than a solid conductor considerably reduces the weight of the reflector. And of course, it is less affected by wind and in general, it provides a more stable structure. Now for the center feed mechanism, a spherical reflector is placed at the focus. The spherical reflector redirects the emission back towards the parabolic reflector where they are re reflected in the proper direction. So in the image, as you can see, the feed cable and then we have the feed point wherein 
the energy is being radiated, there is a smaller spherical reflector that serves as, of course, a reflector for the electromagnetic signal radiated by the feed point. It sends those reflected waves towards the bigger paraboloid reflector. The paraboloid reflector would then reflect all of the signal towards free space or towards the atmosphere. And then another type, we have the horn feed mechanism. The primary antenna is a small horn type antenna rather than a simple dipole. The horn is simply a flared piece of waveguide material that is placed at the focus and radiates towards the reflector. So as you can see, instead of a regular dipole antenna, it is switched with a horn type antenna. And then it functions the same way as the previous, previously discussed antenna. It sends the electromagnetic waves towards a bigger parabolic dish. And the smaller reflector is no longer needed since all of the electromagnetic energy is sent towards the larger parabolic dish. Lastly, we have a Cassegrain feed mechanism. In a Cassegrain feed mechanism, the primary radiating source is located in or just behind a small opening at the vertex of the paraboloid rather than at the focus. The primary antenna is aimed at a small secondary reflector this is called a Cassegrain subreflector located between the vertex and the focus. So in this case, instead of a concave smaller reflector, we have a convex subreflector. Now the convex subreflector will reflect the electromagnetic waves toward the larger parabolic dish.